Here we go. This is State of Control, your monthly look at control and automation for the world of audiovisual. My name is Tim Albright. I'm your host. With us, uh, as always, uh, Steve Greenblatt, Control Concepts, Mogul, and Grand Poobah. How are you, sir? Great, great. How are you? Long time no see. Yeah, yeah. Steve, Steve <laughs> jokes. We spent an awful lot of time together this year. Uh, the most recent was at the commercial environment uh, in Orlando. Very good time was had by all. Uh, so so if, you're, if you're interested in that, as you can actually... the aviation team. There's a bunch of us. Yeah, there was a, there was a ton of us. Uh, mostly on the, on the commercial side. There's also... It was co-located with CE Pro's Summit as well. So uh, next year is in August in D.C. Uh, if you want to apply for that. So good stuff. Uh, somebody I haven't seen since Cedia, though, is Mr. Rich Fregosa from Fregosa Design. How are you, sir? Good, good. Well, uh, what is it? Mellow West Coast greetings. Mellow West Coast greetings. <laughs> Rich is still in, on hangover mode from the Giants winning the World Series. Still having a blast. There you go. <laughs> I, I've been waited. You know, I waited forty years for the first one, and now my little guy just thinks we have a parade every year. Well, just, yes. you know, <laughs> <laughs> Not every year. Every uh, other year. That's all right. Exactly. Three uh, even. Uh, let's go up the West Coast, if we can, to Beaverton, Oregon, uh, the home of Byamp and Kylie Henner. Kylie is the has the best title in the world, the Director of Customer <laughs> Experience. How are you, sir? Doing great. How are you doing there? Doing fine. Some Good. nice Byamp product, uh, some, some uh, Byamp uh, processors behind you there, so if you're watching the video. Got the, the rack o' gear. The rack o' gear, and, and some fine Middle Atlantic racks as well, I That's see. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and last but not least, Dominic Accurso, uh is the Integrated Partner Manager for Crestron. How are you, sir? How are you, guys? Good afternoon. Good. Uh, all right, so let, let's talk about this. Uh, in, in the world of pro programming and automation, and, and I will preface this, this podcast and, and this show by saying this. This is going to be primarily geared towards programmers, right? Not that, that all the rest of ours aren't, but there are some topics we've covered that kind of span you know, manufacturers and end users, stuff like who owns the code and, and you know, uh, best practices and stuff. We're talking to programmers on this one because we're talking about modules, right? Uh, we're talking about those little things that make your life better or you curse uh, whoever made the module, one of the two. Uh, I was joking with Dominic off the air that I was cursing him yesterday as I was trying to pull in uh, a clear one module. Uh, no offense, Kali, I didn't design it. I'm, just, uh, I'm keeping my mouth shut. I was I was actually cursing it and cursing the person who designed it because I would. And then you should pick up the phone and call Michael, right? And say, yeah, I was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would have much rather been been programming a a, a, a biamp one. Uh, but, but but these are the little things, right? The the things that make our lives easier. Um, let's not let's not mince words here, but. You know, Kylie, you guys make some some really good stuff, some some complicated things. And yes, you could provide all of us wonderful programmers, people who are smarter than me, the the codes, the the command codes for every single thing that I want to do, right? Except to do that, it would be oh my goodness, and, and, you know, incredibly difficult uh, for some folks. Uh, and then you know, so you guys partner with Crestron, you partner with with third party programmers. To write these little modules, right? That that lets me just you know throw something at it and it volumes up and volumes down and gives me feedback and it's it's a groovy thing. Um, so actually, Kylie, we'll, we'll start with you on this. How important are these uh, are these little modules when it comes to uh, manufacturers, the people who are, who who are trying to get things controlled from a control uh, automation? Well, well, I think from my perspective. Um, you know, we're seeing the integration industry under increasing pressure to get in and out of jobs as quickly as possible. Um, so from a manufacturer standpoint, uh, it's really to our advantage to provide uh, some modules that make it easier for the integrator. Um, because like I said, they're trying to get in and out of jobs as quickly as possible. So any, any tools or tricks or anything we can do to help make their job easier makes our product more appealing to them. Um, so while, you know, I won't say that a manufacturer necessarily has an obligation to, to create or, or provide modules, it's certainly, it's certainly in Biome's best interest for us to, to make them available to our dealers. Okay. Uh, then, Dominic, from, from your guys' standpoint, from Crestron's standpoint, um, uh, from the manufacturer of these control systems, how important are these 
uh, like like Kylie said, you know, you you where you're trying to get in and out of jobs um, under you know under budget a lot of times, yeah. uh, really ask budget at, at at budget. Extremely important. I mean, uh, that's kind of the core of, of my department and the guys that work on the team with us is uh, is making sure that we provide these control modules uh, in a timely fashion, but also for the most important projects and and products. So Biamp's a perfect example. Um, and uh, you know we worked with uh, actually Steve and his team. They uh, they they produced the uh, the most recent Biamp module, which was the Tessera, mm -hmm. um, and that's one of our actually our most downloaded modules uh, to date. Uh, you know a lot of the Codex systems as well. Um, so so those things um, are something that are heavily relied upon uh, on our dealer base, and so it's very important that we have um, these devices up and and, and available to uh, to the dealers. Okay, uh, uh, Rich, from a programmer standpoint and, and from programming, how much should we rely on the modules? Uh, because there are some modules that, uh, you know, I'm going to mention the fact that Steve made the, the latest one, uh, the Tessera one. How sh how much should we rely on these? Not very much. Rich's mic. <laughs> oh, there we go. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Rich is at a loss uh, for words. I don't know. I, I have never. I've known the man for three and a half years. I've never known him to have a loss of words. <laughs> exactly. I think I just self-edited myself, so I didn't get in trouble with my first answer. There you go. <laughs> Smart man. Huh? That was a, that was a subconscious self-editing. Uh, <laughs> I think that the modules in and of themselves are great tools. I think that used in the wrong hands is kind of like handing a toddler an espresso and a puppy, um, <laughs> you know, and setting them loose. Uh, you know, part of it is is being able to deploy it and being able to use it as a stepping off point. You know, when it when a module is written, a module is intended to bring together every function in a device. You know, basically a manufacturer and, and whoever's partnering with them is saying, okay, here are all of the things that our device can do. So we have to account for all of these because we have no idea necessarily how the dealer is going to use it. They may use 10% of the module, they may use 50% of the module, or 100% of the module. So you are creating a module kind of for the lowest common denominator initially, which is here's everything you have. And then it becomes a matter of deployment. Well, if the installing dealer or the you know or the programmer that's coming in doesn't necessarily know the product you're flying a bit blind so I think that you know you use you use them with discretion um, you understand the tools that you're using and then you push them out now are they a huge time savings in terms of being able to get up and running and figure out if something's not talking right out of the gate with their provided module you know that you know you've got something you can very quickly troubleshoot um, but you know again like anything else it's about efficiency and it's about using the right tool for the job. So you know, I did, you know, we use them absolutely, but we also spend a bit of time answering the why questions about how something works, as opposed to just pushing it out there and hoping for the best. Yeah, and th there are some instances. Um, I mentioned I was kind of joking about the program I was writing yesterday. Uh, there was a program for there's a module for we're using some NEC monitors. Uh, and yes, could have used the module, but all I'm doing is powering on and powering off, right? Um, I don't care about feedback. I don't care about anything, anything else like that. Then I can take the code and you know knock a, a power on, power off feature. So that's that's no big deal. Uh, Steve, from from two standpoints, right? You you not only program these things, but you also write the modules itself. Uh, describe that process. Do you uh, you know does does Biant come to you and say, Steve, we think you're great. Can you can you write this this module for us and then you know walk us through that kind of that step. Sure. Well, it all stems from the fact that you, you take a complex API and then you you need to take that and make it into something that is in a, a bite-sized piece that a programmer can manage and, and understand. And, and mo mo modules provide benefit for programmers of all different types and sizes. Um, for certainly the novice, more novice side uh, of the programmer, the more important I think a module would be. But for experienced programmers, if you have a good module, it increases your efficiency and, and your capability. And, and just like Kylie said earlier, you know the importance of being able to keep a pro keep a project um, done uh, on time and within budget. Uh, I think the modules help to leverage that. But uh, 
the the approach that we take is that we we look to partner with with manufacturers and and help them to develop develop modules across many different control platforms. I mean, we certainly want to focus on um, on Crestron, but but we also do um, AMX and some some of the other uh, control platforms on the residential side. And what what we can offer for them is is a complete solution that makes their product uh, a, a pre presented in a consistent manner across all of these different platforms. And then when they they also have a resource in us to be able to help to solve problems for the, for their customers, and and uh, we also look to grow with them to be able to to continue to support the product as the product evolves, and and you know for us everything is relationship based, but that that that's uh, I think where what what the value that we try to bring and and, and where the uh, the the selling point is in in uh, in this type of a, a relationship. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Dominic. These modules take, um, you know, let's let's take Biamp because that's that. You know, Kylie's on the on the phone here. Mm -hmm. You've got um, all of these capabilities, right? And right. and different modules have different things. And, and in Biamp's case, you have several different modules depending on what you're trying to do. Yep. Uh, for display, you're probably going to have one module, right? Let's let's talk yep. about you know the the Biamp or the displays. Mm -hmm. You're going to shoot it. Some information, right? You're gonna you're gonna give it a a, a press a, a button press, and with that you're going to do this and this and this. You're gonna pull the information, whether that's volume control or whatever, or mm -hmm. volume level. And it, it takes something that's inherently incredibly complex and simplifies it, right? right. Does that kind of devalue uh, the programmer? Does that make them you know less important, um, and, or does that you know open up uh, the case for less experienced people who may not be you should be doing things like this, um, or does that you know just enhance our, our own capabilities? I don't think it devalues. Um, you know, in, in most cases, when you're let's say turning on a, a display, no matter whose display on and off, um, that's not the only thing you're doing in the room, right? You're probably mm -hmm. setting a scene. You're probably turning on a VTC system. You're turning on maybe a, you know some lights, light settings, uh, maybe having shades come down. So you're doing other things in, in that environment which would require the programmer. So it doesn't really devalue the programmer, it just enables him uh, to kind of get to that point quicker and faster and on to the next job. So like Kylie was saying earlier, uh, especially in today's day and age, you know, systems are getting more and more complex, um, but the requirements and the needs from the, from the customers are also growing and, and the expectation of, you know, why isn't this done yet is always looming, you know. So uh, I, I think things like, like this uh, enable them. Uh, one of the other things that I would like to add is... Uh, We've been doing Crestron Connected for about five years now, maybe five and a half, six years. Um, and that's, uh, you know, on the display side of things, it's very heavy. So we're doing projectors and flat panels mostly. And that's really working with the manufacturers of these products to enable our firmware on the device. So it ships um, basically with that connected firmware on the device. So when you plug it into a Crestron system, you know, it raises a flag, you know, NEC display or whoever says, hey, I'm a Crestron device, and we have native communication to that device without the need for a module. Um, but with other devices that are more complex, like the Biamp Tessera or some of the other codec systems, a module is absolutely necessary. Well, and, and real quickly, just in case someone's never heard of, of a Crestron connection, sure, sure. What, what does that mean? So um, it started, like I said, about five or six and a half years ago um, uh, when we were working with uh, TI, and, and they were developing the uh, DLP chip for projectors. And what we did is uh, we worked with them and the manufacturers at the manufacturer, at manufacturer level to implement uh, our control firmware and, and protocols into uh, low-cost projectors. It was originally focused uh, on the K-12 through markets. So low-cost projectors, you know, $800 uh, price point, and you'd be able to go and deploy these in, say, a, you know, a classroom or multiple classrooms on a, on a network uh, and you'd have control right from your laptop. A teacher can come in and plug in and log into a URL and basically turn on, let's say, a BenQ or NEC projector, um, you know, right from right from their laptop. Basic controllability. Um, if it was on a larger network, which you know, RoomView, which is now called Fusion, um, you'd be able to man monitor, manage, and control that entire network of projectors. You can see the lamp life. You can see if they're on, if they're off, what input they were on, uh, and have total. Um, visibility to what was going on uh, in the environment 
and so we have that today, uh, and it's gone beyond DLP. Now we're doing you know flat panels, LCD projectors. Uh, we've even done some AV receivers and even door locks. Um, so it, it's a program that's kind of grown uh, expansively, and I think we're going to continue to grow it. But I still think at the very core, to go back to the original conversation, modules are absolutely necessary. Um, but this is just one more tool, even in a programmer's belt, um, to help them make things a little easier and make them a little more uh, fluid in terms of uh, deploying a system. Okay, absolutely. Uh, is there a list, by the way, not to dive into this, but is there a list on the website because I didn't realize the... Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. There's a, if you go to the Crestron website, the quickest and easiest way to find it is uh, typing Crestron Connected in the little search bar. It's one of the first uh, options that comes up, and then uh, you can look by... Uh, product type or even manufacturer type, and we have a full listing of models and and brands. Very good. All right, Kylie, from from you guys, just from Biamp standpoint, as as a manufacturer, somebody that's trying to get something uh, controlled, how much time is spent? Do you think uh, trying to develop these and and also in in your training when you're when you're training people on how to program your stuff? Because you know, is it is it something that you take? Um, your in your classes and in your in your training, something you de delve into, or is it something that you just kind of leave? for the manufacturer side yeah, too. We do cover our, our control protocol, not so much the modules, but we go over the control protocol. I mean, we spend, you know, the Tessera class is a, is a three-day training, and we spend, you know, maybe an hour and a half going over the control protocol, the, the basics of the syntax and, and the basic commands and, and how that functions, and, and let our, our students um, get hands-on by, you know, manually typing these commands into a, a terminal emulator and seeing how they work. Uh, we do make mention that the modules are available from, from both Crestron and AMX um, and and kind of, you know, highlight that they are there for the, you know, for those that want to use them. But, you know, honestly, I mean, Biamp is, you know, we're not control system programmers at Biamp, so we're not intimately familiar with, with you know, the, the ins and outs of a Crestron or AMX or other control system. Um, we do have a few people on board who have kind of taken that on as a, as a sort of, you know, side project, but, you know, no one at Biamp is a full-blown experienced control system programmer. So um, we're not really in a position to uh, speak really, really intelligently about all of the ins and outs of the modules and how they function. I mean, we, we certainly can talk about them at a high level, but um, if it comes down to serious debugging about what's going on in the module, um, that's, the, you know, that's not necessarily Biamp's job. I mean, we will help out as much as we reasonably can, but at some point, the, uh, the, the control system programmer needs to take some responsibility with, you know, debugging what's going on with the, with the control system. I mean, and, and it's a give and take. I mean, we're going to help them as much as we reasonably can. But, you know, once again, you know, we don't manufacture the control system. We don't, you know, we don't program the control system. So our ability to support it, you know, is, is limited to, to some extent. Well, that, and that, that actually raises a, raises a good point. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you uh, because... Uh, I have on many occasions emailed Steve or called Steve and said, hey, I know you wrote this module. What's wrong with it? Um, who should we call? I mean, if, if you're either in the field or, you know, you're sitting at your desk and, and you know, you've got some time to, to crank this out before you go on site uh, and you do run into an issue, do they call you? I mean, because I mean, here's the thing. I, I, I only knew this because I knew I know which ones you've written. But, you know, do they call Biamp? Do they call, you know, Crestron or AMX? Who, who, where do they start? I... It typically, the the conversation starts with Crestron, from what I understand, and and you know, um, but we certainly make it known, and and Crestron knows too that because because part of this this arrangement is we we need to have that Crestron partnership, and 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 you know we we speak with Dominic and his team often, and they give us feedback on what they hear, and and typically when a call comes in to uh, technical support. If it gets past tier one, usually the tier two people will reach out to us if it's something that's a more of a complex issue that they either need us to support them, support the client, or or Biamp um, contacts us as well. In 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 some cases, uh, if something gets escalated, they, because the products are complex and and very configurable, it you also you have to take the time to really. Uh, narrow down where the issue lies, and and uh, you know it, it could be something that is is a a, a module issue, or it could just be a a, a module versus um, configuration of the device 
compatibility that that we just have to to uh, smooth out and and uh, but because of the relationships that are in place uh, we we have that we make ourselves available to 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 whomever is is has the that question and and when we we understand how um, the protocol goes to to um, to elevate an issue. Okay, uh, Rich, from, from your standpoint and from a let's let's use you as as the uh, token programmer. Uh, how much should we use these? I mean, you you said before, and I I mentioned the fact that there are times when, you know, yes, there's a module available, but all you're really doing is kind of you know power on power off. Uh, but you know, a little bit more intricate things or a little bit more complex things, that's when we'll, that's when I'll use a module. Uh, but but from your standpoint, how often should we, you know, how much should we lean, lean on these things? Uh, I mean, the, the first time that you're ever dealing with the object itself. I mean, so, so many times, you know, when, when you're working with a new device, because again, you know, every year there's going to be an upgrade or there's going to be a new model or there's going to be, you know, a new technology coming out. Um, you know, there, there's things that change in terms of how these devices communicate. So our first rule is always, hey, you know, let's let's make use of the tools that the manufacturers have gone, you know, to the trouble to provide it for, you know, the, the initial reason. If you get this brand new unit and we throw it on our on our test bench, you know, that's the first thing we do is we load up the module just to make sure, hey, is this working the way that we anticipate it to work without deploying it into a production system first. Um, and at that point, you know, it's it's important to know what the devices that you're controlling, what they do and how they react and how they're potentially going to be integrated into the you know a larger uh, some of the parts, um, and then at that point you know depending on the skill level of the programmers involved, then you can decide okay do I use that as a jump off point uh, like you were just talking about you know I really just want to turn this thing on and off. Well, rather than spending all of the time trying to figure out what on and off means, you already have a template that you can work with. Um, you know you're not having to completely reinvent the wheel and you know go through the API and find each part of the communication protocol and oh my gosh you know you missed a, a tilde here or a colon here and you know now this thing's not responding and four hours later you find out that you made a typo I mean that, that that's that's you know some general real world stuff that happens to people is that you know they it keeps your mistakes at a minimum so that at the very least when you're commissioning a system you can say yes you know this this works this isn't communicating properly, and and it, and it provides everybody the opportunity to very quickly diagnose a problem. Because, you know, say you're a programmer, you're on site or you're off site, and you've got an integrator involved, you've got a facilities person involved, and you've got IT involved, and so you have all of you know all of these different people who are part of this team. And you know, gosh, you know, when something goes wrong, nobody, everybody blames the other person. You know, the the programmer saying it's hardware, and the you know the integrator saying it's the programming, and both are saying, well, you know, gosh, it's that piece of equipment, and IT is in the background going, you know, you guys are all idiots. So, um, you know, we 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 just use it as a way to be able to establish the the you know the the minimum benchmark. And then be able to go from there. So yeah, I mean, absolutely, make use of the tools that you got. You know, why why spend all of your time, you know, inefficiently if there's something there? And then if you want to modify it or scale it down or build on it or you know, again, if if you can trigger something coming in off of an incoming phone call, that you can go ahead and trigger the lights or raise the shades or lower the shades or change the lighting to a video conference setting as opposed to an audio conference setting. Yeah, absolutely, use it. Um, you know, but again, like, it's like I was saying, is that know the tool that you're using at that point. Um, you know, always the minute that you grab the module for a device, the second thing that you should be doing is downloading the manual for the device. Amen, brother. <laughs> I mean, Amen. Richard made a good point about the, the sort of minimum threshold, and, that, and I think certainly with BiAMP's products and, and the, the flexible, configurable nature, that minimum threshold's pretty high. So for a a programmer to come into, uh, you know, programming a control system for a biomp to Sierra blind, if someone just handed them the protocol document and said, go make this Crestron work and have it up and going by tomorrow morning, that's going to be a pretty tall task. I mean, it's going to take, you know, a, at least a day or so to read through that protocol document and really kind of grasp everything. Um, and, and, you know, as I was saying earlier, uh, you know, people don't, don't have the time for that anymore. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure to, you know, turn around these jobs. So if the module gives them a shortcut to get to that sort of, uh, that, that minimum operating level, then that's, uh, you know, that then it's serving its purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let's kind of take a, a, an interesting or, or a side glance at this because this is something that I've personally ran into. What happens if the module doesn't do everything, right? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and and the re- I, 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 I'm not uh, going to call out any uh, codex specifically, but that that's actually where I tend to run into it, uh, our, our codex, where mm-hmm. you know good and well that they'll give me, you know, I don't know, incoming call, you know, uh, status, but the module doesn't have it or it doesn't have something else. It doesn't have a way for me to reject the call, even though I know good and well that the, the IR does. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you on this one. What, what, what at that point do you do? Do you, do you just start searching around for the command protocol, or do you, you know, something where, uh, where you call up the codec manufacturer and say, "Hey, dude, you know, your module doesn't do this." Well, I th- think you bring up a good point, and I think that there, that that uh, what one thing to point out is when you have a, a module that's what we would call certified by the control manufacturer. Typically, we tr- they they try to include all the functions that you need, but but you know, versus if you have something that's kind of written in a, a rogue manner that you might get download off of, you know, the Yahoo group or something like that, that might just be a subset of the controls that were just needed for a particular project. So, you know, that, which we that can neither confirm nor deny that that group exists. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you saying right. that there's a group on Yahoo about control people? You know, the, there's there's one thing just to point no, out. You know, what what where are you getting this module from? But um, but but the uh, to to answer the 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 question directly, and you know, when you do need another feature or function or command, what what we personally do is you have to then rely on the API. And I, I think one thing that to point out, and and it's something even with a some a programmer that's learning, modules are a great tool. But you have to make sure that, to to Rich's point earlier, that you have to understand them and you have to be able to pr- troubleshoot them and you have to be able to in, under, interpret the API as well. Because it, otherwise, if, if if you rely on a module and the module isn't working for one reason or another, you, you know you, you can't just throw your hands in the air. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what I, we, I agree. What we do in, I was going to say what we do inevitably is you know add to the augment the module let's call it with the, with those additional you know five percent of the commands that you might need. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, reinforce what, what Steve just said there. I mean, a, a control system programmer needs to know how to do more than simply plug in the module. They need to know how to program from scratch based off the, you know, the, the, the published protocol document. Um, they're both tools. They're both skill sets that they need to have. I mean, I, I, and I think it's, you know, I, I think certainly for Biams products and the, the flexible nature of them, I, I think it's unreasonable to expect the module is going to do everything for every project that's out there. The module is going to establish, you know, kind of this 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 entry level point. But you know there's each job is unique and there's the crazy requirements that come up from time to time and a control programmer needs to know how to you know tackle those manually. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they can't, I mean that's you know that's that's kind of a bigger a bigger discussion. But that's that's my opinion on the yeah. on this situation. I, well, I, and, I, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I actually tend to agree. So, so with these complex devices like the Codex, the Biamp devices, and, and these very flexible, um, configurable devices, uh, we frequently will get um, additional requests for features that may not be in the API or just not in the module. Um, and like Kylie said, uh, you know, the mod and, and Rich, and, I'm sorry, and Steve said as well, um, uh, the module is written for 90. 95% of what the device can do. Um, that other 5% we may have left out. Um, I, I, you know, when the, we try to release these devices and these modules, we want to hit, you know, the broad swath of the programmers that are looking to control a device. But what with devices like the Tessera, they're extremely configurable. Um, there may be things that are not in there, and in, in which case the programmer may need to add them himself on the fly. Go ahead, Rich. Well, I, I was I was about to to add to this as well, and again, you know, like I said, we're speaking to programmers or, or dealers, whoever. Generally speaking, these modules are created in a controlled environment. A controlled environment is not a production environment necessarily. So I keep coming back to, you know, know what you what you're doing with it, and, and again, it, I mean, let's let's also be honest. I mean, we're we're still human. These are still people who are writing this code. Mistakes are going to happen from time to time. There's, you know, there's stuff that, you know, say you've got a codec or you've got a, you know, an AV receiver or you've got a, a, a security interface panel. 
You know, I mean, there's 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 quite a bit that's going behind there, and everybody shoots for a hundred percent accuracy. Mm -hmm. But you know, I I've been a beta tester and an alpha tester, or, or even in production environments where we've deployed something and went, this is broke, and it just so happened that yeah, you know, this was of the ninety five percent that got QC'd. Yeah, this fell within that you know two percent that maybe didn't get QC'd because they don't have that set up necessarily in their environment that winds up getting pushed out into a production environment. Or maybe it didn't account for latency or noise or chatter on a network or something that winds up using the same port. Or I mean, there, there's, there's a variety of things that can happen once you hit in, into a production environment, which, again, the as long as you use the module as a starting point to be able to get a better understanding of what it is that you're doing. And also keep in mind that, you know, potentially the people who were uh, brought in, not necessarily Steve, but again, anybody who's brought in it. You know, some of the manufacturers will use their pro, you know, their their staff, their developers, to write the module. Well, maybe they're not as versed in Crestron or AMX as they are in their own API. You know, their API is maybe built for a web interface and it's been ported over to talk to a control um, device. So, you know, in in much the same way that. You know, as an integration programmer, we're having to learn all the nuances of somebody else's API. Sometimes these manufacturer modules that are being generated, they're trying to figure out the nuances of the control system. So there's an assumption based on one that doesn't follow through in another. Then once it gets deployed, it goes out. So you know, um, you know, buyer beware in that in that respect. Um, you know, make sure that when you're pushing it through that you have the capability and also an understanding because again I mean obviously they're doing it for you so you don't have to do the uh -huh. necessarily all of the grunt work but you know be prepared to also put in your fair share of work I mean that's that's the biggest thing that I think the message that I, I you know tend to push to the integrators which is hey you know again if this is a service that's being provided for you um, as a courtesy to the dealer to support you but do not look that as a reason for you to shirk your responsibility in doing your due diligence professionally. Yeah, absolutely. This also comes down to to best practices where I try to encourage the the dealers that I work with or the integrators that I work with. <laughs> Let's mock this thing up in your in your warehouse before we before we hit the the, the client site. Right, um, you're going to find an awful lot of of evils uh, <laughs> in the warehouse, and it's a lot easier to fix there than it is you know as you're trying to reach somebody at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. That, that's a big thing, too, and a lot of the modules come in a package that, that, has, that have a test program that has been deployed so that you should be able to load this in and get the basics communicating. It helps to test wiring and communication and setup and so forth. So it's uh, you know, having that ability to mock up and work with the device ahead of time really could provide a lot of confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, Dominic, you guys made a, what was it, I guess about a year ago, uh, you, you inter introduced the marketplace yes. uh, for modules. So if I'm an integrator, I'm a programmer, and I'm trying to find some weird, you know, I don't know, I, I'm not even going to pick on any, on any one manufacturer, but I, I've got a, a product that I would love to have a module for, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just not there. Uh, whether that's a specific model number of somebody's or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, how do I go about doing that? So we did launch that uh, the application market, and, and the thought behind that, it came actually from a, from a, um, a dealer conference that, uh, that some of our guys had with uh, a group of integrators about two and a half years ago. And we decided that, you know what, uh, the site inherently – uh, in the old days was just Crestron modules and we said you know there's a lot more out there than just Crestron modules um, and so we decided let's let's open this application market and that will allow for um, not only modules but but uh, graphics packages themes things of that nature um, and then basically create a community right I know that there's the the Yahoo groups um, that are used by a lot of the guys today but we decided let's do something a little more um, you know, Crestron centric, and, and you know that we would kind of um, sign off on. And so we decided to launch the application market, and that would allow um, guys like Steve and, and Rich to basically um, submit modules that they've developed um, for their own projects or even for the customers directly, right onto the application market. And if they decided to, they can charge for them, but in most cases, offer them at no charge. Um, and it's really just to kind of grow the community. Um, a lot of guys initially, a lot of the you know the the CSPs, the Crestron service providers, initially had mixed feelings. They got mixed reviews. Some guys really didn't like it at all. Um, they felt that it opened it up to you know 
some other programmers that may not be up to snuff, other guys saw it as a good thing, as an opportunity. And I, and I think it's a kind of a mixed bag, right? And we, and we won't just take any old module and throw it up on the site. Um, but we, we will have some, um, some, some basic restrictions, but we want to also keep it open um, and say, you know, if you, if you develop this module for this, this device that maybe we haven't yet developed a module for, then by all means, why not put it up? We even put a rating system up there. Um, you know, you can kind of rate it, you know, one to four stars and say, you know, I like it or I hate it and give a little comment about it. Um, and they kind of just, uh, you know, in hopes of growing the, the overall community and letting guys kind of trade modules and, and, and uh, you know, input their, their products and their feedback onto this market. And so, I, so far it's been fairly successful. Um, and, you know, we've put a lot of third-party modules on and we still continue to develop our modules internally and, and put those on as well. Uh, two questions for you real quick and then we'll, we'll get sure. off of the, the marketplace. Uh, do you test them? Uh, and is there a way to see, you know, which ones are the Crestron official um, made ones and the right. ones made by someone else? So we review them. We do not test them with the hardware uh, in-house. There's, okay. just, there's just too many variables and there's too many products for us to test every module that comes into us. Um, we obviously do test the ones that we do, do develop. And so the ones that are Crestron developed are actually developed by Crestron. I will say so on that page. Um, if it was developed by a third party, it'll say the name of the, the manufacturer, have a direct link to their website and their, their, uh, their customer support and so on. Um, so the, the kind of the written rule in the, the, the service agreement or the agreement with the, the developer who basically submits these modules is that, you know, you write it, uh, you support it kind of concept, right? So if they wrote a module and there's a bug for it, um, then uh, the, you know we look to them to help fix this bug. Otherwise, we're going to pull it off the site. Um, in the event that they no, they are no longer in business, we would like to get that source code because if it's a popular module, we want to keep it on the site. We want to keep it up and available for the for the customers, and we can kind of take it over from there and then uh, modify it as needed, uh, or update it or fix it. Um, but for Crestro modules, it's still the same process. We get the hardware physically in house. We set it up. Um, like Rich said, it is a controlled environment. We try to make it as, as, as real of an environment as possible. Uh, with the time frame that we're given, it's not always 100% possible. But we realize with the large uh, products like the Codex and the Tessera and so forth, it's a living, breathing module. Uh, we're constantly updating. There's constantly new firmware. There's constantly new commands or, or new requests for commands. So, so they're always being updated on a fairly regular basis. And, and so that's something we always try to uh, let everybody know is that you know we we don't just write a module for especially these larger pieces and just leave it you know they're always being updated uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis. Okay, uh, Kylie, I'm I'm going to pick on you because you're you're, you're our token manufacturer. <laughs> sure. uh, not that Biamp has done this. All right, this is actually uh, what I'm what I'm going to talk about is is the tendency <clears throat> for manufacturers to switch around their command uh, mod their their command strings right. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of times, most of the time, you'll find this in displays, right? Whether it's projectors or or or, or uh, actually flat panels. What? And if you don't know, just say you know it doesn't make sense to me either. Why would you do that? Why would you let's say that you've got a a module for you know a one brand's you know X line of projectors, and they come out with a new Y line of projector, and suddenly you know power on is now power off or what have you. Mm -hmm. Why change around the command stream? Well, uh, you know, I, I can't answer specifically why other companies might do it. I mean, I you know, I can certainly say, you know, the our our older DSP product, Audia, has a diff different uh, command structure than Tessera. They are similar, but they are different. And, and I can answer that, you know, the reason they're different is, is really because those two products are different from, you know, from the bottom up. I mean, they use different components, different design, um, you know, different operating systems, all of that. So they really are different products. And while we tried to, uh, you know, take things that we liked in Audia and that people liked and apply those to, to, to Tessera, uh, some of that just wasn't possible because the two products really are different architectures underneath the hood. Um, and, and also, we felt like we learned some things from Audia and, and had some ideas of how maybe we could make some things better. So while I can't speak for other manufacturers, I mean, I, I know that's sort of, you know, I, I know why Biamp has different command structures between its, you know, our two major DSP lines. 
Um, and, and really the reason is because they are two different products from, you know, from the ground up. Okay. And that makes sense to me. Um, display manufacturers, that makes no sense to me. <laughs> Freaking power on is power on. Okay, what's the... Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I was, I, I think manufacturers, I mean, it, it's in their best interest to make this stuff as easy as possible for the integrators and the control system programs. <laughs> I yep. firmly believe that. Um, you know, the the integration industry is one where the integrators are under a lot of a lot of pressure, um, and so as a manufacturer, we want our products to be as easy to integrate as possible. <laughs> and therefore, I mean, we shouldn't be changing our command structure around willy nilly, and we shouldn't be adding features that aren't documented and and all of that stuff. I mean, we want to make this easy, and that's you know that's certainly core to you know FIAMP's you know philosophy, absolutely. Can I tell you what one of the manufacturers that I love to program for it? And Dominic, you may want to put your muffs on for this. Um, <laughs> but it's Extron, right? I mean, Extron has had the same freaking command structure for, well, 15, 20 years that I'm aware of. Uh, and it's simple, right? It's not it's not a, a, a 25 character long command to volume up or volume down. It's four or five, maybe. And it's very, you know, and they haven't changed it either. So, all right, uh, Rich. As we wrap up here, what's something that that you wish uh, either the com the control manufacturer or or the manufacturer of the products you you wish that they would know and 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 feel your pain on when it comes to dealing with these modules? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the biggest thing is that it's it's you know the the message we keep hearing is that we're playing together, we're playing together, we're playing together. I mean, I my feeling is that you know you need to be dog fooding the entire time. You need to have each other's equipment. You need to be running each other's equipment, whether you're setting it up in your conference rooms, whether you're setting it up in um, your different lab areas, whether you're sending it with these programmers home, you know, in some of the residential markets. I mean, I, I, I really think that um, a big part that gets lost sometimes is that we don't always consider the production environments that these are going into. Because, we're I mean, again, we're isolated. You know, we're we're... We, we are constantly sitting there in our own office and we have our own viewpoint and kind of a, you know kind of the glasses that we look through of how this system should be working and sometimes we forget how normal people or normal companies <laughs> um, use it and I mean it's a danger that we all fall into is that you know the the age-old question of not could we do it but should we do it and focusing on like we were just talking about which is you know here is the simple module like you were just talking about here's on off X y and Z Here's the advanced module. You know, maybe one supplants the other, maybe one works with the other. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in providing the tools, the diagnostic tools that should come with a device, which you know, either, you know, yeah, well, we say that you can do this with a terminal. Okay, well, great. On your site, why don't you go ahead and list all of the things that here are the proven tools that we've used. You know, this is how we made it work when we put it together. Um, and to be able to to help the dealers out. I mean, again, a, as you become a more accomplished and uh, kind of road weary uh, uh, control systems programmer, you you wind up having this secret bag of tricks that you accumulate. I mean, I've got stuff that you know over twenty something odd years that you know I've still got. I mean, I've got little software tools that are fifteen years old that are still part of my bag of tricks because I know if I have a problem communicating to device I can whip this thing out and find out very quickly where that problems coming from and and so that that's really where I see it is that you know where's the we talk about cooperation but we don't necessarily produce the items that instill cooperation because again we're we're all separate companies we're all these individual entities and so you know what are some of the tools and and that's where we've had some real good success with some of our integration partners is okay great you know here's the tech support number for this or here's a hotline for this for the module contact this email address not necessarily a person because it might be a group but you know if if you are going to go down that line here is a process that you can follow you know, even just on their web page in, in a fact, you know, having a problem with this, click on this link, and it, at least it brings up that section of the web page or, you know, the right extension to call or the right email address for support at dot, dot, dot. And it, it's the little things because typically, you know, no, nobody ever stresses out when, when a module goes well. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, you know, how are you planning for your worst case scenarios and putting things in place for when something goes wrong to streamline the process so that, yeah, at 2 o'clock on a Friday, which, again, you shouldn't be loading new code on a Friday, but just in case somebody is. Oh, uh, I'm going to this Friday, just so you know. 
I got a building <laughs> a going brave man. that they've been two months <laughs> behind schedule. I am definitely loading several rooms on Friday. I hope that the A B gods are with you. Yes, you, you uh, both. Yeah, that's it. Uh, no, no code, no load Friday. Yeah. <laughs> and I may have even been doing it on Saturday, but that's a, that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, I think you know. Again, I think that some manufacturers do a better job uh, than others of um, you know. Here's a module. You know, you know, on a Domini, rock me on my Go with God, my son. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would, you know, for me, it's always the tools. Is, is that it, it? You know, I'm not asking you to spoon feed me the information, but at least give me one place that I can go to get the information. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, as we wrap up, Kylie and, and, and Dominic, keep your phones on because both of them have Crestron and and Tessera products. So, uh, guys, that's going to do it for this month. Uh, Dominic Acurso, uh Integrated Partner Module uh, Manager. Uh, for the integrated, the manager for the integrated partner program for Crestron. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate uh, it. How, how can people find you and or Crestron? Uh, they can email us at partners at crestron.com, and that goes to myself and, and, and a couple of guys in the department as well. So that's anything module related, uh, and, and so we have a couple of guys uh, on the background that do the actual development. I manage the group. Wow, I never knew that email existed. Partners <laughs> at crestron.com. There we go. Yep. Uh, Kylie Henner. Director of Customer Experience, the greatest title in the world. I uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and how can people get a hold of you? Uh, support at Biamp.com reaches Biamp's global tech support department. I'm part of that list. Uh, I don't do the support anymore, but I oversee that team, so that's the uh, best way to reach anyone at Biamp for any kind of technical questions or help. All right, very good. Uh, Mr. Rich Fergoza, Fergoza Design, thank you, sir. My pleasure, always good, and you know, I I, I think I I kept the, the the velvet gloves on this time. So. <laughs> yeah, you were very nice. Uh, obviously, where where is it? In right there. Boink. Yes, at on the Twitters. I, R Fergosa. At R Fergosa, uh, type my name into the Googles, and all kinds of stuff pops up these days. So that's kind of fun. Pro. CE Pro, uh, yeah. CE Pro dot com. Uh, find me on Facebook, on Google Plus. Um, Twitter tends to be the uh, the good one. Yes, we've just reached a thousand followers. I was kind of oh, that was cool. pretty cool. That that's was pretty cool. Dude, that's that was, awesome. Yeah. I think I have three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm related, I'm related to it's three more than I have. You know. Oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, and Mr. Greenblatt from Control Concepts. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's been great as usual. Uh, you can reach me, my company, Control Concepts, at controlconcepts.net, and I'm on uh, a bunch of social networks uh, at Steve Greenblatt and do a little bit of writing for a commercial integrator and the AV Nation blog. Check that yes. out. Yeah, yeah, Steve, Steve started, started writing for us too, and Rich, you always have a place in if, if, you know, if Julie doesn't like a piece. so uh, Duly uh, noted. <laughs> Duly noted. Um, don't don't follow me or or, uh, or my Twitter, but go to by the website if you would please. Avnation.tv, Avnation.tv. Uh, something kind of cool that we started uh, about a week ago um, is is a Kickstarter program. Um, is uh, here's the thing. Um, we're trying to get to, to integrated systems Europe, ISC 2015. Uh, it, typically for for Infocom or Cedia or something like that, it's in the U.S. And, and a lot of our guys are already going and gals are already going anyway. So, you know, we can kind of mitigate our costs. ISC is different. None of us typically go to that. Uh, and apparently a flight from Amsterdam or from, from St. Louis to Amsterdam uh, I have to mortgage my house for. So uh, <laughs> we, we are trying. We're doing a Kickstarter program. We're about halfway there. So if you get a chance check it out if you would please. Uh, if you go to Kickstarter type in Aviation, or if you go to our website there's a, there's a, a blog post about it and, and it'll take you there. So if you check that out we would appreciate it. If you can't give anything, if you could just send it along to somebody else, that would be lovely as well. So, avnation.tv, avnation.tv. Thanks so much for listening and for watching. This has been a State of Control. <laughs>